Go ahead. Excellent. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this fine conference. Uh, I wish it were the 10th conference, 10th Fortran conference and not the first, but we're on the right track to uh, uh, getting a Fortran uh, community uh, discussion going. So I'm going to talk about the ICON atmospheric model today. And interestingly enough, it has sort of this, has evolved sort of on the same time frame as Copernicus, uh, which Jacob just talked about. Um, there's uh, a long list of contributors. This is a subset of the people who contributed to the GPU implementation of ICON. And uh, the list of the contributors to ICON is in the hundreds. So let me quickly get going. First, since CSCS, CSCS is the Swiss National Supercomputing Center, uh, since we are uh, sponsoring the conference, I'm shamelessly going to make an ad advertisement for CSCS. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, customers from very many scientific communities, including computational chemistry, material science, climate and numerical weather prediction, that's the field I support, uh, is it's actually not the biggest field, but one of the bigger fields, seismology, life sciences, et cetera. We have a relatively, you know, a very big machine called Pitt Staint, which has already been mentioned uh, uh, at the conference here. It is number currently since uh, June, uh, well, late June, a couple of weeks ago, at uh, number 10 in the world on the top 500 list. It is the uh, tw number 26 on the green 500 list. It has nodes which consist of one Haswell CPU and one NVIDIA Pascal P100. Um, for people who don't know what GPUs are, they consist of many, many tiny cores, and they attempt to do single instruction, multiple data or multiple thread parallelization. Um, that is my advertisement for CSCS. And so now let's go to the talk. So I'm I'm going to give you the shortest imaginable uh, introduction to uh, atmospheric modeling and then mention the prototype in, uh, implementations of the atmospheric dynamic solver and in shorthand we call that the DICOR so I'll be saying that uh, multiple times talking about the DICOR. Um, then uh, I'll present the production implementation, which is actually implemented with neither of those paradigms, but rather with open ACC directives, which uh, have been mentioned a couple of times in other talks. Um, that we are, the implementation is essentially finished. Uh, we are running in production now, at least for one application. And I'll tell you some of the lessons, both positive and negative, we learned from uh, uh, the GPU implementation. And then uh, I, I have started out very ambitious, uh, trying to say how Fortran might evolve. Of course, we have, have uh, our wish list also, like uh, Jacob. Um, uh, but I'm very lucky that one of my colleagues from the OpenACC Consortium, uh, Jeff Larkin is going to uh, uh, present high, highly parallel Fortran and a open ACC directives. So I'll only talk from a user standpoint, what we might like to see uh, and showing you some examples of our code. Okay, with that, uh, let me get into the material. Um, so this is the shortest possible introduction to atmospheric modeling. The Earth is essentially a very large heat engine. There are many processes which you presumably can't read, but uh, things like precipitation, incoming insulation from the sun, outgoing radiation, uh, turbulence. Um, there's also the ocean plays a big role. I won't say much, very much about that. Uh, also the cryosphere or sea ice, for example, uh, play uh, a big role. The biosphere also, the land surface. Um, you have to consider all of these things or as many as possible uh, to model uh, the Earth's, uh, well, mod model the atmosphere. Um, how do you do that? Well, the Earth is, of course, is more or less a sphere. You have to wrap the Earth in some sort of uh, three-dimensional grid, 
right? Some sort of horizontal uh, uh, grid. And then in the vertical, we usually take um, you know, what we call profiles or, or parallel, pipe, parallel pipeds, which go in the vertical. So basically you have horizontal grid and then each element uh, in the vertical is, uh, is uh, the same as uh, 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 this, the same in the vertical. Um, so the dynamics solves the 3D equations of motion on a rotating sphere. For those of you who are interested, those are essentially the fully compressible Euler equations. Now to solve some of the other phenomena I mentioned, for example, turbulence, these are things which are on a, of a smaller scale than the horizontal grid I just mentioned. So these have to be parameterized. It's a very uh, tricky thing to describe the effects, the cumulative effects on one grid element of these phenomena. And uh, a couple of examples there, turbulence, uh, hydrologic processes like clouds, radiation, gravity wave drag, I won't go into those details, but these are, are parameterized subgrid phenomena, which influence the, uh, the time evolution of the atmosphere. Um, so basically it's split into this dynamics, which is solving these Euler equations. And those have, I've tried to illustrate here, um, dependencies in the horizontal and the vertical. The physics generally only has uh, dependence in the vertical, which is nice because uh, essentially these processes are independent horizontal. So you add the, what we call tendencies uh, given uh, by the dynamics over a time step and add in the tendencies from the physical parameterizations, usually on different time steps. Then you write out the data uh, and otherwise you just continue with the time loop at the, from the beginning. Uh, the, the state of the atmosphere can be defined essentially through seven variables, which are mentioned here, the winds, pressure, density, water content, temperature. That is the state. Of course, we have other diagnostic variables which are derived somehow from those, of which may be in the hundreds. Okay, so uh, ICON, where does it come from? It's uh, called the Icosahedral Non-Hydrostatic Modeling Framework. Uh, it is a uh, next generation um, uh, atmospheric model designed for numerical weather, but also climate modeling, long time scales and short time scales, as the success to a very famous model called the ACAM model. Uh, it's a joint development of four institutions now, the German Weather Service, the Max Planck, Max Planck Institute for Meteorology, the German Climate Computing Center, and the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Um, I mentioned the DICOR, which is essentially uh, 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 solving these um, Euler equations and coupled with uh, physical parameterizations, as I said before. It's roughly a million lines of Fortran 2003 code with a couple to uh, Fortran 2008 extensions, some utilities in C++, and uh, to, to model the climate, you also need to model the ocean. And there is a corresponding icosahedral hydrostatic ocean model, uh, basically with the same grid structure under development, which I won't talk about here. Okay, um, icosahedral, it is all based on the icosahedron. So you take uh, icosahedron, which is of course 20, consists of 20 regular triangles. You pump it up into a sphere. Okay, that's probably not the resolution which you really want. So you can successively bisect the edges. Bisect the edges, pump those triangles up to spherical triangles. Uh, and then you can do that zero times. So this is a, a sphere with 80 spherical triangles. Uh, then bisect it again, uh, 320, and so forth, as far as you want to go. So, of course, we're talking about much higher resolutions here. And not only that, you can, uh, you can bisect in only certain regions of the globe to make a static, uh, static nested grid. You might want to do that if you were interested in having higher resolution in some places to study the phenomenon there without having the expense 
of the model running at that resolution on the entire globe. Uh, what do you do then? Well, in the horizontal, you define a space filling curve, which goes through all of those uh, little triangle, well, all those triangles, uh, also on the high resolution and the low resolution grid, it might look something like this. There's a lot of cleverness in the space filling curve, which I won't go into. Okay, well, that give, gives you essentially two dimensions. You have a horizontal dimension and then the, the vertical levels in the model. And, but we don't use a two-dimensional uh, uh, two uh, 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 array, but rather three-dimensional arrays. We chop it into blocks. Uh, and then in each block has uh, a blocking length, which for historical reasons we call n proma, And that turns most of these uh, prognostic variables, which you saw in the pre previous slide, into three-dimensional arrays, number of blocks by the n promo or block length, if you like, times uh, the number of levels. Okay, so there's I won't say much about the domain decomposition. Obviously, this is running on hundreds to thousands of nodes. But basically, you take a subset of that space filling curve. You create a halo around it. Uh, then you have the subset of that three-dimensional field, including the halo, uh, on each rank. Uh, we're using MPI for uh, uh, domain decomposition. You could also use Fortran co-arrays. Uh, there is at some point uh, a halo update, and then all the ranks uh, between those halo updates work independently and asynchronously. Um, I won't mention anything more about the domain decomposition. So from now on, you can assume we're talking about only working on one single node with a global address space. Okay, so a little bit of history. We started out, remember these three-dimensional arrays, that's very important. One over the blocks, and that's the uppermost loop, which I hope you can read. There's some sort of work associated with getting indexing information because these um, uh, arrays m might have this uh, nesting feature I mentioned. And that at the lowest level, uh, you see a loop over all the levels and a loop over the local, um, uh, local block, if you like, that n proma, essentially one to that n proma uh, block size. And so we implemented that in OpenCL. And what you see there is essentially the translation of the kernel in OpenCL, the underlying code, uh, underlying kernel. And we did the same in CUDA Fortran. And again, there's no real magic to it. It's just essentially for each thread from JB, JE, and JK, you have to find whether uh, they are in the right, well, whether they're active, and then you do the underlying operation, which comes after the if statement. Well, we presented our pr prototype solvers uh, to the ICON community, and they said, uh, that's very nice, but there is no chance that we will ever put that into our code base. Um, so, we will well, say a little bit more about uh, the issues or the concerns of the icon developers in a, mi in a minute. Um, so we decided to, the most promising path was to implement everything with directives, which were acceptable. Obviously there are open MP directives in the code. There are other directives in code, which you will see later on. And that was a multi-year effort, first in a PRACE. PRACE is a, um, a European funded ag agency for computing centers, essentially, uh, uh, to implement the dynamical core or the die core with these directives. And then uh, later on, a Swiss funded project from the Platform for Advanced Scientific Computing. We called it the ENIAC project. Uh, it's an acronym, not the original uh, supercomputer from the 1940s, to adjust the dynamical core to make it more compatible with the physics de developments, which were then implemented uh, 
uh, in the same, same project. So just to give you a general idea, the dynamical core is maybe 30, 40,000 lines of code, and the physical parameterizations, which reported are maybe 100,000 or 150,000 lines of code. Okay, so we, success story, right? Uh, we uh, finished, essentially finished the implementation in the last months. It's now running in production on a, uh, a climate simulation, which is planned for 2.8 kilometer horizontal resolution. I won't give you the numbers, but that's a lot of horizontal uh, uh, grid triangles. Um, what you see here are three different solution, uh, resolutions, one at um, 160 kilometers on the left, both for CPU and GPU, uh, 20 kilometers CPU and GPU, and since we didn't have enough CPU nodes, just the uh, 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 GPU numbers for 2.8 kilometers. What you can see here essentially is very good strong scaling for uh, the CPU, slightly less good scaling for the GPU. We knew that you have to keep the GPU occupied to get its best performance. And thus we'll only run the code when we know the node is essentially fully loaded. You can also read off the uh, weak scaling by looking across from the X to the, the uh, hyphen to the, uh, to the dot. Basically they're on the same line you have eight times more work going between those resolutions and thus uh, ignoring the fact that the time stepping changes, you have uh, eight times, should have eight times the time. So weak scaling we achieved, strong scaling, uh, scaling we achieved somewhat on the GPU. The bottom line is we got a four times, 4.9 times speed up between a single Intel uh, CPU, Haswell CPU, and a P100 uh, GPU nodes. Okay, that already brings me to the lessons we learned, uh, or some of the lessons, uh, at least the ones which are applicable to this uh, conference. So new technologies are very difficult for this community, right? It's a Fortran community. They don't like things like OpenCL. They don't like things like C++. That's already too difficult. They don't really like things like domain-specific spe languages, which have not yet been mentioned here, but uh, uh, are a, a frequent approach to solving problems in a particular domain. They don't like proprietary tools. For example, CUDA Fortran uh, is a proprietary tool from PGI. Uh, directives are accessible, but as you'll see in a moment, I'll get back to this, they have a major impact on code readability and maintainability. Big problem for us, ICON is monolithic. So basically you have to compile the whole thing and then you have unit test, uh, there are no unit tests per se. You can run tests on a subset of the entire system but there are no real unit tests or component. Now this is really critical for developing GPU code. You need a unit test for the, uh, for example, physical parameterization you are working on in order to make sure that the answers coming from the GPU are the same as those on the CPU. We had to create that testing infrastructure, that validation infrastructure, and that was actually in terms of man months or, or FTEs, a bigger job than the actual GPU port. That was uh, perhaps a negative lesson. Um, interestingly, these, and I'll come back to this, physical parameterizations are either 0D, right? In other words, they operate only on the lo local cell, uh, or 1D, 1D in the vertical. I'll get back to this. But the developers are optimizing the code for 3D, right? And you'll see examples of this uh, in a minute. There's no separation of concerns. We, they really should be developing their 1D models and then not worrying about how those are mapped to 3D in an optimal way on a certain architecture. Oh, so why are these experiences important for this conference? 
Well, first of all, uh, let me tell you that the climate and the NWP community are among the staunchest Fortran supporters. So I believe Tiziano uh, mentioned that people are not developing new models uh, using Fortran. That's definitely not true. Okay, Icon has a 20 year history, so we won't consider that a new model. It's obviously not Dusty Deck code either. But uh, just recently, within the last four or five years, major pro uh, project has started that the UK uh, Meteorological Office uh, uh, to develop what's called the Elfric model, which is yet another model, a competitor of Icon, if you like, in Fortran using Fortran 2008 features and above. Um, we decided to go for direct. Uh, it's not clear what the long-term future of directives is going to be. And one aspect of this is the current competition between OpenMP 4.5, which includes uh, accelerator directives, and OpenACC. Are, are they one, is one going to win out? Is, are they both going to coexist? Or maybe both will be dropped uh, in the midterm future. Um, and moreover, directives are merely, let me say this provocatively, band-aids in compiler functionality. Uh, and you'll see in a moment that these directives are really a mess in the code. So let me get to the example. So you remember those three loops I pointed out at the very beginning, one over the blocks, one over the, uh, the block length, and one over the number of levels. Now, and what you can see here is there's lots of if defs in the code. So this is the actual production code. It contains large numbers of if defs to turn on and off different features depending on what target architecture is. If OP45 with these accelerator directives were inserted, it would be more uh, if defs in the code. So all I want you to get out of this particular slide is the code is ugly. I think we can all agree with that. Those simple three loops and uh, they've turned into 20 some lines of code. But let me just briefly take a closer look exactly at this code. So you have uh, at the top level, you have a multi-threaded loop. You see at the very top, it's obviously an OpenMP parallel region, and then an OpenMP do loop, creating a certain number of threads or the block of threads. Um, this loop is not always directly in front of the other loops, but it can be four or five levels farther up Uh, include those particular directives which optimize certain things. So these two levels of loops, my point I want to make right here is these fundamentally varied loops. One is a multi-threading loop and the other is a SIMD or vector loop. Now Fortran 2018, a lot of reading about the do concurrent, uh, 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 do concurrent loop, uh, it tries or attempts to address both of these, right? Multi-threading loops and CMD loops. That, in my mind, is a very hard thing to achieve by one paradigm. Um, there's one other very subtle thing going on here. Obviously, you see there's an open, AC, open ACC parallel region in the code. You see that in the middle in blue. And it's due, well, defines the parallel region, it defines that the two loops coming are collapsed, and it assumes that they have no uh, uh, dependencies. That's all fine. There's a very subtle thing in this default keyword, which I think was mentioned by another speaker. It's making an assumption that the data is cached on the accelerator memory, so that it's not necessary to make any hosted device transfer uh, at that point. It assumes basically that the data was all copied over 
to the, ho uh, to the device, to the GPU, if you like, at, uh, before the time loop. And it's already present there. I won't go into uh, uh, any more detail about that, but it's a very subtle point which would also have to be addressed, the data management you like, uh, uh, that the data is cached on the accelerator memory. Okay, uh, I'm all finished. Let me just take one last slide to explain another tool which was developed in this ENIAC project called CLAW. CLAW is, well, we are hedging our bets uh, with all these different directives which you have seen, right? We've defined meta directives, if you like. So CLAW is a source to source translator which takes Fortran and these CLAW directives and generates Fortran either with OpenMP or OpenACC directives. Um, it has certain uh, features. Uh, you can hoist loops, as I mentioned in the last slide, but it has one very useful feature in this particular community, namely that uh, it has a single column abstraction. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning that these physical parameterizations, for the most part, have only dependencies in the vertical. And you see a case here where uh, of a loop which is only dependent on uh, JK, right? There is a dependent in JK. There's a JK plus one, which you see, but not in the long, in promo blocking, and not in the number of blocks. Now, you don't see the number of blocks because, as I mentioned, the number of blocks is many, many subroutines above this, right? That block loop in physical parameterizations. We developed this compiler, or actually my, my colleagues developed this compiler within the NAAC project to uh, uh, allow the developer to only define the algorithm one column only, and then to extend it uh, to uh, multiple dimensions we use claw directs. Uh, and that means the arrays, for example, they have to be promoted, 2D arrays to 3D arrays, uh, the, co the compiler, it, it figures that out and uh, generates corresponding mood with the correct dimensionality. Very sophisticated tool which addresses some of the uh, issues which I've brought up uh, before here. So let me just with take home messages. Uh, again, the climate modeling community are your most devoted Fortran developers. They're not very adaptable to new uh, technologies or other programming languages. Uh, GPUs are, and distinct memory space are here to stay. This is a problem which the Fortran community has to address because look on the top 500 list, all, let's say in the top 10, these are all GPU machines now, GPU or ARM a couple of ARM processor machines. Um, Icon has implemented on NVIDIA GPUs, albeit only for the climate. The uh, WP numerical weather prediction code is not yet there, but will be later this year. Using OpenACC and a few calls to an NVIDIA specific library, that's to avoid so called uh, atomic events. Uh, the key problem in the port was, well, twofold. One, I mentioned uh, the, uh, there was no testing infrastructure, but that's particular to ICON. But the big problem in porting OpenACC codes is not mapping loops to the architecture. The big problem is managing the data on device. That's one point I want to leave you. That can be considered software managed caching problem. Uh, as I mentioned, Fortran should evolve. Uh, I don't know if you concurrent sufficient to uh, address the multi-thread and the SMD, SIMD parallelism uh, remains to be seen. Uh, like I said, uh, will it be successful? I don't know. Perhaps we need another paradigm in Fortran. And 
I'll leave you with a pointer again to Jeff Larkin's talk tomorrow at uh, 20 past 8 uh, European time on high highly parallel Fortran and open ACC directives. And uh, that is it from my side. Thank you, William, very much for this talk. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, yep. I'm on there. Uh, let me go up a little bit. Oh, there are a number. <laughs> um, thoughts on the impact of pragmas or directives on the maintainability of the code. It's a big problem because there are multiple different types of directives in the code. There are people who are editing the OpenMP directives. They validate their code for OpenMP, but then they don't validate it for OpenACC, and they don't know that changes have, need to be there. And in fairness, I do the same thing and don't necessarily test the, test the OpenMP code. It's a serious maintainability pro problem, and we have, we have test infrastructure to try to avoid that. Um, is the GPU versus CPU scaling comparison in terms of cost? That is, no. Okay, this is a very legitimate question, uh, which I see someone has replied to. It depends on the, the contemporary printing of the GPUs and the CPUs. You'll find that until recently, the GPUs have been very expensive, and the cost is. Uh, on the cost basis, they come out more or the same. But that is in the whole story, the GPU is less power, for example, comparatively less power. Um, and the price tends to change if uh, NVIDIA feels there's more competition from other, uh, other uh, uh, vendors. Uh, let me just check the time to see how much time I have. I I think I'm more or less out of time, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, we would move on to the next talk. Maybe, maybe okay. you can move the discussion to Slack. I think there are- I will more. move, I will answer all of these questions, replies. Perfect. Thank and you.